All right. Well, I'm excited this evening to introduce a mentor of mine and also a friend. Um, he has taught me a lot and helped influence my thinking when it comes to uh, creationist uh, biblical worldview, and he's also taught many others uh, from this perspective. And so Dr. James Johnson uh, serves uh, ICR as ICR's Christian Education Program, uh, including ICR School of Biblical Apologetics and Origins Matter short course series and ACI series lectures. And previously, he taught at uh, Laterno uh, University, Dallas Christian College, and Cornell, uh, Concordia, sorry, <laughs> uh, University in Texas. And so he's taught on history, ethics, biosciences, ecology, apologetics, evidence, law, and international studies. Dr. Johnson's forensic science background includes a JD at the University of North Carolina, and uh, he's a trial attorney and a judicial experience, two post-doc certifi certifications and American Academy of Forensic Science membership. So he also wants to share with you that he's, a happy, to, he's happy to be redeemed as a Christian and uh, saved by God's grace in Christ and a Bible-believing creationist with a worthwhile message about the need to blend the Great Commission with the Genesis Mandate, which is what he's going to be sharing with us. So I want to introduce Dr. James Johnson. Thank you, Jared. Um, and I would add to that that you can't get saved if God doesn't make you in the first place. And I'm just <laughs> thrilled that he made me. Uh, but I'm also thrilled that he saved me. And that early in life, he put people in my life who brought his truth to me. And so um, we have two big topics that we're blending together tonight. And I will try to pace myself responsibly, but I better ask for God's blessing on that or it won't happen. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for those who are here tonight and those who will look at the recorded version of uh, these messages and we ask that you would be honored in the presentation of the truth and insights that come from your word and link to the world that we live in and we just are thrilled to belong to you and we ask that you would be honored with our time tonight and tomorrow in Jesus name. Okay, <clears throat> blending the Great Commission with the Genesis Mandate. Um, the first hour, I'm going to just introduce the overall concept of the Genesis Mandate and the Great Commission and how they fit together. And I'm going to use one illustration in particular <clears throat> so that you'll have an idea of, of where we're headed. But then we'll look at more details from that. Uh, William Carey, what is William Carey known for? Don't all yell at once. Father of modern machines. Okay, where did he go? So would you say he's a good example of, of uh, involvement with the Great Commission? All right, so he was very much involved in the Great Commission, taking God's truth to the outside world, and, uh, <clears throat> but he also was very involved in the Genesis mandate. They'd be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Um, not only did he translate the Bible into languages of India and was involved in church planting and other missionary activities there, but while he was there, he was very disturbed to learn that the, one of the Hindu customs where he was <clears throat> in Serampore was that when a man died, his wife was burned to death at his funeral. Uh, that's a terrible thing, but they did it all the time and, and they were okay with that. And William Carey was not okay with that. And he wanted somehow to team up with the right people to get that changed. 
Uh, you can see that that's a violation of the be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Uh, long story short, William Carey got together with the help of an American missionary named Marshman, a Danish trade colony governor named Ole B., who himself was discipled by a Lutheran missionary named <clears throat> Christian Schwartz, who's sometimes called the Apostle to South India. Um, Carey was more known for reaching North India. But, uh, and there were others who helped too. There was a, a, an, a, a, uh, an Indian leader uh, who I don't even think was a Christian who helped them as well. And after a number of years of, of struggling and politicking and trying to get the British government to change how that was handled, they were successful. And so this a Hindu custom called sate, or sate, depending on how you pronounce it, was abolished. And as a result of that, um, it became common when a man died that his widow survived and remarried. And many of the people who are alive in India today are descended from second marriages that would not have happened were it not for William Carey and his friends. So uh, he was very much obeying God's command and helping uh, the people of India to, to put into practice the be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But at the same time, he was also very much involved in being, uh, serving his role in the Great Commission in reaching the people of India with, with the New Testament message, the gospel of grace, and the Bible in general, having it in their language. So it's not an either or. You don't have to decide which thing am I going to do in life. Am I going to try to obey the Great Commission or am I going to try to obey the Genesis mandate? William Carey is a good example of someone who, whose life as he served God was furthering both of those um, directives of God. Well, the, the, uh, the Genesis mandate is not what it used to be. Um, here's the original version of it from Genesis 1, which was given by God before Adam sinned. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish. Or you could translate that, fill the earth, and subdue it. And here's where the word dominion comes in. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That was the original command that God gave to Adam. That was before he sinned. And at that time, mankind had dominion over the animals of the earth. When we get to Genesis chapter 9, and we're just on the uh, aftermath of the flood at this point, and so Noah and his family and the animals disembark the ark, God renews his mandate regarding being fruitful and multiplying, but you'll notice that it's a little bit different this time. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. You don't see the word dominion there. What you do see is that God is putting a disposition into the animals after the flood to, to be uh, not as comfortable around humans, not as so they, they have a fear or they're shy or they're wanting to uh, um, get away from the humans. And that is the, the, um, uh, the default. <laughs> that, is, that is the starting place, the starting disposition of animals. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't tame wild animals. You can. But if you don't tame them, if you don't take active uh, um, uh, measures to, to teach an animal, to train an animal, that you are caring for that animal, you are feeding that animal, you are giving food to that animal, you are protecting that animal, you're not scaring that animal, 
um, then you can tame an animal. Now some animals are a lot easier to tame than others. And obviously if you have an animal from birth or if in, in the case of chickens from hatching, if you raise those animals from as early as they can remember, then they're gonna trust you in a way that uh, a wild animal that you meet in a, in a forest or a wildlife refuge is not going to trust you. But anyway, the point being, there is a difference in the relationship between animals after the flood that didn't exist before the flood. Of course, before the flood, what were humans supposed to be eating? Not animals. They were supposed to be eating stuff that we would call the plant kingdom, that is fruits and vegetables and nuts and, and uh, you know, root vegetables and grains, things like that. But after the flood, Noah and his family are told, you're now to eat meat from animals. And of course that means that uh, the animals better have a disposition to run and hide because otherwise they could get um, wiped out pretty quick by greedy fallen humans who uh, aren't respectful of population dynamics. Okay, well anyway, that's, so that's our Genesis mandate is be fruitful and multiply. And that often is um, remembered when we think about pro-life topics. What often is not included or not um, uh, uh, given attention is the third verb in this directive, and that is the filling of the earth. Now, some look at that and go, well, that's just kind of a redundant way of saying, you know, keep having more babies, keep having more generations. Um, but there's more to it than that. In fact, immediately after the flood, what's the next major thing that happens that's recorded in the book of Genesis, the Tower of Babel. And what's the problem there? They're not filling the earth. They're told to fill the earth, and what are they doing? The opposite. They're staying in one place, they're, 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 um, and, they're say, and they're telling you why. They say, we don't want to be scattered upon the face of the earth. So we don't want to spread out. We want to stay in one place together. And God is not pleased with that. That is disobeying his command. And so he, he uses the division of languages to separate them as people. And they end up eventually obeying what he wanted. Although it's not because they had good attitudes. It's because they now are split up by languages. So uh, they end up spreading out around the earth. Um, I'll just mention as a footnote that <clears throat> a few of the scientists that I work with at the Institute for Creation Research um, are of the opinion that, that the Ice Age happens in the centuries soon after the Flood. And that it is a serious enough difference between the way the, work, the world works now and the way it was, uh, the conditions of the world then, that the ocean levels, they think, would have dropped enough to where some of the island chains, like the Aleutian Island chains that spin off the uh, southwest edge of Alaska, if you drop the ocean level some, you turn that into a land bridge. So just at the time when God is wanting the human race after the flood to spread out and fill the inhabitable continents of the world is at a time when you have um, uh, easier opportunities to do exactly that. And then when the ice age fades away, um, you don't have that same opportunity, okay? Now, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, risk my life on that, but, but I, I do think that my friends are correct on that. But anyway, um, the point is that God did want people to geographically fill the earth, to live in different habitats. And now I get to a theme that I will harp on if I can remember to do so repeatedly, this evening and tomorrow, and that is God loves variety. Mm -hmm. And so God has made different habitats for different animals to live in, different plants to grow in, and different people to live in. And God makes people with lots of variety, and he makes animals with lots of variety, and he makes plants with lots of variety. God loves variety. In fact, he loves variety so much that we're all unique. And so uh, I'm not in competition with anybody because I'm unique. And you're not in competition with anybody. You're unique. 
Now, in a sense, I am in competition uh, because I'm in competition with the person I could be who honors God or the person that I could be who dishonors God. So I'm, I'm in competition with the potential persons that I can be for good or for bad, but I'm not in competition with anybody else. Okay. Now we come to the Great Commission, which you likely know inside out anyway, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There's quite a few verbs in that in that um, those two verses or that verse and a half. Look at all look at all those verbs there. But which is the one verb that is a command verb? It's the make disciples of all nations or teach all nations. Now, uh, in this particular translation here, you see teach and teaching, but you can see next to those two words that they come from two different Greek words. So the participle teaching has the idea of didactic teaching, teaching head knowledge. Um, but the command verb, teach, that comes from a Greek word that is, is training, is discipling, is teaching someone to learn that is more um, like role modeling it's what you do in your family it's the way that you train your children you are not just giving them head knowledge you are showing them how to do things in life to be successful so that they can honor God with their lives um, and that is the, the heart of the Great Commission is teaching all nations in a discipling way and in the process of teaching all nations in a discipling way, you'll end up with baptisms, with teaching head knowledge, and the, uh, the goal is that they will ultimately be guarding or observing all the things that the Lord has commanded. And, uh, and of course, in the process, you're going, you're journeying, you're traveling. Um, the whole idea of going, that... that uh, that fits very well with the, the third part of the Genesis mandate of, of filling the earth. So that means family history is important. That doesn't mean that only family history is important, but family history is one subset within the Great Commission. That is, it can be a very important part of us doing what is assigned to us to do as part of the Great Commission. And that is passing the truth on in a, in a practical way to our family members. And that doesn't just mean our children. That could mean our siblings. That could mean our cousins. In some cases, children are teaching their parents. Um, you know, it's, it's um, the most obvious example is parents teaching children, but that's not the only family relationship where learning can take place, teaching can take place. And of course, grandfathering, grandmothering would be a, another example of that. And in many cases, you have people who are acting like a parent to someone who they have no biological uh, connection with. And uh, so yeah, usually they, they'll use the word mentoring for that, but it's, it's a similar thing. So the Great Commission and family history are often tied together, and we'll talk more <coughs> about that. But let's think about the two families that are really important, uh, the, the two most critical families. And one is the family that God chooses to put you in biologically. That's God's choice. The family that I was chosen to be put into biologically, I had no choice in. Nobody asked me. It just happened to me. And it was God's choice to make me have the parents that I have, to have the siblings that I have, to have the grandparents that I have, to have the cousins that I have, the uncles and aunts. That was God's choice. And because it was not in any way chosen by me, don't hold it against me, who I, who I belong, who, what family I belong to, my birth family, okay? Of course, you also can't give me credit for it either. Uh, if, if, but the, the contrast is with God's forever family, and that requires a choice. And so that's where we make a decision 
that either we want to belong to God based on the redemption that's given to us in Christ if we want it, or we don't. John chapter 1, starting at verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power, or you could translate it authority, exousia, has the idea of, of the legal right. Uh, so he, he gave us the legal right to become God's children's children. God's um, uh, the Greek word there has the idea of, of a building or God's little buildings. I mean, children are little buildings of their parents. And so God has built into our lives and he's building our lives and we ultimately um, belong to him forever because we are in Christ. And that is available to even to them who believe on his name. So we have really two family histories. And that is the biological history that God gave us to get us here on planet Earth. And then we also have the family history, our spiritual family history. Um, how did we come to Christ? Who taught us the Christian faith? Who are the people who we have connected with because of the Christian faith? Maybe we've shared the Christian faith with. Uh, that's, that's our spiritual family history. And don't forget, you could have been a grackle. Now, when I was driving home one day from work, there's a certain place where I make a left turn and there's a pond and I'm a bird watcher and I've been a bird watcher since second grade. That's a whole other topic. But I love birds. And so at this one particular little pond that had cattails, um, somebody once said, what's a cattail? I said, well, it's kind of like a corny dog stuck on a you know, long straw. But a lot of times you have red-winged blackbirds, uh, you'll find them with, with cattails. And sometimes you'll find grackles. So I was looking at these grackles, and then it hit me. That could have been me. And it's not a thing I could have done to stop it. If God had decided, Jim, you're going to be a grackle, there's not a thing I could do to stop it. And don't say it couldn't happen to you, because it happened to that grackle. It happened to him, and he couldn't stop it. So I have thought about that for many years since then. And uh, there's a church that I sometimes speak at in Florida. They call me the Grackle Man because, because they know I could have been a Grackle, but they could have too. Anyway, never forget that. God did not have to make you who you are. He didn't even have to make you human. He didn't have to make me human, but he did. And that's, um, that's something that's real important and not to be taken for granted. Okay. With that in mind, our birthday should be reminders to us that God chose to be our creator and chose to create us as who we are. So every birthday is a full lap around the sun. <clears throat> Here, little uh, uh, Brendan is having his fourth birthday, and he's celebrating his fourth lap around the sun with his sister Olivia and a little neighbor boy. Um, birthdays really should be enjoyed by Christians more so than anybody else. Because we know the one who gave us human life that we celebrate once a year when it's our birthday. <clears throat> um, so, before we move on in this topic, we'll uh, recap these very basic principles that we never need to uh, forget. And we always need to keep these in mind. And that is, we need God to create us in the first place, or we don't get here. And then secondly, we need God to save us from sin, or it doesn't do us any good that we got here, especially in the future. And then, we always need God to give us truth. If God did not choose to give us the truth that is in the Bible, guess what? We wouldn't get it. We are utterly dependent upon God to give us the truth that is in the Bible. There's some things that we can learn apart from the Bible. There's a lot of things we can learn apart from the Bible. But there's a lot of things that we would never know if it wasn't for the Bible. God had to make sure that the Bible was given to us. Um, in the book of Jude, it talks about the, the once forever, the, the, the faith that was once delivered to the saints. It was given to us. 
and of course that's the Bible. You might notice in that picture that Adam is scratching his side. He's kind of He's waking up from his anesthesia thinking, my side feels different for some reason. Anyway, okay. All right, so now we're going to think about the Mayflower Pilgrims because they help to, to illustrate a blending of the Genesis Mandate and the uh, Great Commission. Okay, so we're going to go back 400 years, um, and we're going to... Think about the fact that when God wants to move people, he has many creative ways of moving people. And sometimes those ways are very comfortable and they're fun and they're enjoyable. And we go from one place to another and we enjoy the journey. And then there's other times when God uses some set of circumstances to move us from point A to point B and it's not comfortable. And persecution is one of those things. And many times in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is some adversity, whether it's persecution from other humans or whether it's, say, a, a, a famine in the land. Okay, remember how the book of Ruth starts out? That uh, in Bethlehem, they're, they're having a famine. They're having food crops that are not successful. And so Naomi and her family move temporarily, they think, to Moab just to kind of weather the storm of this famine. And as it turns out, her husband and her two sons die there. So they never come back to Bethlehem. But when Naomi comes back, she brings Ruth with her. Well, God wanted Naomi to meet Ruth and for that relationship to get started so that Naomi would bring Ruth back to Bethlehem so that Ruth would meet Boaz. And that's part of the Messianic line. So God is always accomplishing many things at one time. And, uh, and sometimes he will use persecution or some other adverse circumstance to move people from one place to another. We see in Acts chapter 8 that there was a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. As a result, the believers were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. They might not have, they might not have moved out of Jerusalem if it hadn't been for that persecution. But if you'll notice, as they were scattered, everywhere they went, they were preaching the word where they went. This ended up taking the truth to places where otherwise the truth would, would not have reached, at least would not have reached as quickly as it did. So when they were scattered, they preached the word wherever they went, Acts chapter 8. Reminds us of the parable of the sower and the seed because the word is compared to seed um, more than once in scripture a sower went out to sow a seed and as he sowed some fell into good soil and when it grew it produced a hundredfold so one of the things we do is we we take the word with us we share it and we don't determine what will happen and some seed will fall on good ground and some seed won't but um, that's not our responsibility but it is our responsibility to share the word now we come to Jeremiah 29, 11, which many people love this verse. Don't you love that verse? Okay. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So this is a good verse. You could call this a happy verse, right? But what is the context of this verse? The context of this verse... <clears throat> is a terrible situation. It's the Hebrew people have just been expelled. They've been captured by the Babylonians and hauled to Iraq. Now, we can't appreciate what that experience was like because America isn't that old of a country. Um, <clears throat> I would tell you how old America is, but except <clears throat> Even though my wife's not here, I know that she would tell me, don't do math in public. Just embarrass yourself. So I'm not going to attempt to do the calculation. I'm going to let you figure it out. All I know is <clears throat> uh, at the end of the 1700s, that's when America is kind of officially a nation. And, uh, and it's now 2021. But 
the Jews, after they leave Egypt and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, they end up going into the promised land of Canaan, which later becomes known as the land of Israel. <clears throat> so they show up about 1400 B.C. And the Babylonians kill off a whole bunch of them and take a bunch of the survivors as captives to Iraq in uh, right around 600 B.C. So from 1400 B.C. to 600 B.C., I'm going to make a wild guess that that's about 800 years. hope I'm right on that. But anyway, so that means the Jewish people had enjoyed autonomy in their own homeland for 800 years. America's not that old. America's not even half that old. So we don't know what it would be like to be the generation that knew this is our homeland. We have been here for 800 years. And then all of a sudden, God allows a very heathen, very wicked, very idol-worshiping army to come in and, and just defeat them uh, uh, ignominiously and haul off a lot of the captives to Iraq, to Babylon. What would that be like? Well, that's actually the context of Jeremiah 29, 11, this very happy verse. And let's look at the context of that. <clears throat> they are being told, you're going to be here a while. And some of you are going to be here for 70 years. Some of you aren't going to live that long, so you're going to die in Babylon. Get used to living here. You're not going to see Jerusalem or the land of Israel for a long time. In fact, for those of you who survive, you're, gonna, you're not going to go back for 70 years. Get used to living in this wicked foreign land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all who are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. God has taken responsibility for hauling the Hebrews to Babylon. Yes, physically, it was the Babylonian army who did the, cap, uh, the capturing and the, and the hauling them back. But God is saying, I'm behind that activity. I'm the one who wanted that to happen. And so he says, I have cause to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build yourselves houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them, take for yourselves wives, beget sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters unto husbands, that they might bear sons and daughters, that you might be increased there and not diminished. And then he says, pray for the place where you live and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captives. What? Pray for Babylon, this wicked city that I don't want to be living in? Yes, pray for Babylon because that's where God wants you to be right now Jews of the captivity and he wants you to pray for the city that you're now in that it will have peace because if it has peace you will have peace now with that as the background we read Jeremiah 29 11 for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil or calamity to give you an expected end and if you look at the Hebrew word that's in verse 11, it has the idea of God is giving them something that comes after them. So that's why I use the picture of a, of a ship, and you see the wake, you see the, the, the water disturbed behind the ship. Sometimes we use the word the footprint. What kind of a footprint are you leaving? What will be the impact of your life here on earth? Part of our legacy is how our lives affect other lives. So what is the future of my life? Well, once I die, I really won't know the full answer to that question because the future of my life is continuing to be written in the lives of people who were affected by my life. And the same is true for all of us. So the people whose lives you are a blessing to and you are sharing God's grace to, as their lives benefit from your life 
And as God's work in your life is carried over into their lives, and then they pass it on to the, someone else, and that someone else passes that on to someone else, all of that is connected to your life. All of that is really part of your future. Your legacy is, is not going to be determined when you die. And so Jeremiah 29, 11 is reminding the people that the value of what you are doing in the now won't be known until much later down the road because um, our lives are providing benefits for other lives and many of those other lives aren't even in existence yet. So we're trying to look at the big picture here and of course the Genesis mandate when you think of be fruitful multiply fill the earth you're not just talking about one generation and you're not just talking about three or four generations. Um, it's kind of funny uh, I better be careful I tell this story because this is being recorded. But anyway, I remember once my mother-in-law, who's now with the Lord, um, saying that it's really only four generations that count. And I forget how that came up in conversation. And, and my wife said, well, what do you mean it's only four generations that count? Okay. Uh, do you think your parents are important? Yes. Do you think your grandparents are important? Yes. Uh, okay, what about your kids? Are they important? Yes. What about your, your grandkids? Yes. Anyway, so she went through more than four generations. She said, okay, which one of those generations doesn't count? <laughs> anyway, um, every generation counts. And uh, what, by the way, which, one, which of our ancestors do we really need? Every one of them. If you're missing one ancestor, you don't arrive safely on planet Earth. So uh, we should be thankful for every ancestor we have. God has used them to bring us here. Going back to the concept of, of uh, movement and to how God sometimes uses negative circumstances to move us from one place to another, let's think about David. David compared himself to a partridge. Uh, he said uh, when he was fleeing Saul that he felt like a partridge who's being hunted in the mountains. Now, a partridge is one of those ground fowl, kind of like a grouse or a pheasant, um, you know, kind of a kind of like a chicken, but they, they're, not, they're not big flyers. You know, you don't see a bunch of, of uh, partridges or, or pheasants, you know, flying high in the air. That's not their thing. They're mostly on the ground. They can, they can jump up a little bit, fly a little bit, but they're mostly hustling around the ground, and so they are prey for animals that want to eat birds that are on the ground. That means they need to know how to hide, and they need to know how to escape. Um, <clears throat> One thing about partridges, if you think about it, as vulnerable as they are, we still have partridges. David was talking about partridges back, uh, you know, sometime around uh, 900, uh, 1000 BC. And here, 3000 years later, we still have partridges. So a lot of them must be surviving. They must be pretty good at hiding and dodging and evading their predators, at least enough to successfully start the next generation. So uh, God is making sure that the partridges are, at least a lot of them are surviving. And David felt like that. Well, in the New Testament, <clears throat> we're told multiple times, look at those verses in the, in the uh, bright blue, uh, the Matthew 6, uh, Matthew 7, 6, and then those that follow in Luke and Acts, we're told repeatedly to evade persecutions when possible. And we're, uh, there's also uh, verses that talk about when you go somewhere and you try to share the gospel and they basically hate your message, what are you supposed to do? Shake the what? Shake the dust off your feet and go to somewhere else where they're receptive. So, um, if there's a country that's really hard to the gospel, maybe the timing is not now for continually trying to push the gospel to them. Maybe we should be looking at that verse that says, shake the dust off your feet, go somewhere else, because maybe somebody, somebody somewhere else is ready for the good news of Christ, and you need to be there. Anyway, 
the, the dust itself will be a testimony against the, those who repulse the gospel when it was offered to them. Um, <clears throat> persecution is nothing new. When, were, when was the first believer persecuted by an unbeliever? Cain killed Abel. Abel was a believer. His brother Cain was an unbeliever. And Cain didn't like hearing the truth. And so he killed his brother. So per, uh, unbelievers persecuting believers, not wanting to hear the truth, and being very hostile about it, that's nothing new. That goes back to the first human family. Nothing new on that. Okay. <clears throat> so now we've got to speed through the pilgrims in order to stay on track. So let's think about the pilgrims. <clears throat> There's a lot more to the pilgrims than just uh, eating turkey. They came to uh, America for religious freedom. Um, <clears throat> it didn't happen the way that they planned it. They did not plan to come to Massachusetts. That was not their plan. They wanted to come to Virginia. Now, at that time, the territory of Virginia actually went all the way up north to the Hudson River. That is the Hudson River that's by New York. So Virginia was a lot bigger territory then, but Massachusetts is even north of that. They did not want to go to Massachusetts. Why did they want to go to some place within the territory of Virginia? Because it already was established. It already had a government. It already had people living there. They didn't want to go to a brand new wilderness and start from scratch. That wasn't their plan. I mean, these were families. <clears throat> but God had a different plan. God wanted them to go to a place where there was no government. And that would force them to invent their own government, which would be a pattern for the American colonies um, more than a century later when the American colonies were inventing their own government from scratch and were saying, we're not going to have a king, we're not going to have a royal family, we're going to have a, a representative government, we're going to have a constitution. They, uh, the founding fathers <clears throat> in, the, in the late 1700s who gave us the constitution, uh, being led by Madison, they did on a larger level what the Mayflower Pilgrims did on a smaller level, and that is start from scratch, make a representative government with a document that explained uh, the, the basics and what we call a constitutional republic. Okay, at the beginning they just wanted religious freedom. They didn't know that they were going to be doing this uh, political pioneering as well. So uh, <clears throat> it was a big adventure and they were moving from a place that they knew well and was familiar to a place that they did not know <coughs> at all, only two of them had actually seen the place where they were going to land. The rest of them on the boat, this was, they didn't know what to expect. And um, <clears throat> who, when they got there, whose land did they take? Okay, I ask this question in many different contexts and it's always kind of fun. In fact, I covered this material, some of this material very recently and I had, I don't know, four or five voices near the front of the group who said, they took the Indians land. And no, they didn't. Because <clears throat> as it turned out, the land that they ended up settling into, Plymouth, was land that nobody wanted. And the reason why was <clears throat> three years before that, the tribe that lived in that land had a plague and they died. In fact, there were only two members of that tribe who didn't die, and the only reason why they didn't die was because they were somewhere else. In fact, they were on the other side of the ocean. <clears throat> and so the tribe who lived there all died of the plague. So then the neighboring tribe said, free land, let's go take it. And so they settled into this land, and they died. And so now you have empty land again. And so then the neighboring tribe to them said, hey, free land. Whoever lives there dies. We don't want it. <laughs> and so they left the land alone. And so when the pilgrims show up, they're not taking anybody's land. They're taking land that nobody wants. And this is something they didn't know right away, but they learned later. And, you, and you, uh, their second governor, William Bradford, documents this in his book, Plymouth Plantation. 
that about three years before the coming of the English, thousands of them died. And eventually, and some of these were, you know, as far as 40 miles away from where they were, but eventually they found evidence of this with skulls and bones found in many places lying still above the ground where their houses and dwellings had been. A very sad spectacle to behold. Um, anyway, they described it as a wasting disease. Uh, the, the soil was good, but there were no people living there. <clears throat> and this was discovered uh, when uh, Edward Winslow and Stephen Hop Hopkins and Squanto were walking around one day. All right, so let's go back before they discovered that to their voyage. And uh, I'm going to have to go through this a little quicker. So here we see on the map that they're going across the Atlantic Ocean. And sometimes the sailing was smooth and sometimes not so smooth. All right. About halfway across, an autumn storm strikes. They weren't supposed to be sailing in autumn anyway, but they had some delays because of a leaky ship. That's pretty important. And so they ended up getting off to a, a much later start than the original plan was. So they run into weather that uh, they would not have run into if they hadn't been delayed. Anyway, the ship begins to leak, the main beam cracks, and some of the sailors go, we're just going to die. Okay, but as it turns out, they don't die because the pilgrims had brought with them a big screw used for a printing press. So when you think about, you know, something going to press, in the old days it literally was pressed. They took paper, they took <coughs> ink, they dabbed the ink on the dies, they put it together, and they had a screw thing, kind of like a vise, and they <coughs> pressed it together, and then when they un unscrewed uh, the press, you had the ink pressed onto the paper. So it really was a printing press back then. Well, because they had this huge screw that would be used for a printing press, they were able to take the, the uh, fractured beam and jam it back together and hold it in place so that the uh, ship was able to survive that, that crisis. All right, now one other thing happened, and that is a passenger was thrown overboard. You know, that's not a good place to uh, become a Baptist, full immersion, <laughs> but that's what happened. Um, so his name was John Howland. He was an indentured servant, and as the ship was rocking in the storm, he happened to be on, on the deck, and when the ship jerked, he just went and went flying off the boat into the Atlantic Ocean. And by God's providence, a rope went swinging through the air and slapped up against his hand and he grabbed it. And that was a good thing. And so as he's going down into the water, he's holding on to this rope. He's underneath the water, still holding on the rope. And then when the ship jerks itself back in this direction, he comes flying out the water. I mean, it's kind of like fly fishing, except for it's, I mean, you can picture this. And here's this guy hanging on for dear life. Uh, this is John Howland, he's a young guy. He's an indentured servant, you know, a temporary slave. Well, uh, we learn that he later, three years later, is going to marry Elizabeth Tilly. It's pretty easy to understand that if he had drowned then, he would not three years later have married Elizabeth Tilly. Now that makes a difference if you're going to have children of that marriage and if you're going to have grandchildren. Well, as it turns out, at the time that he is underwater in the Atlantic Ocean, Elizabeth is 13. She has her parents with her, but they are going to die before one year is up. And so she is going to be adopted by the Carvers. Uh, uh, I'll think of his first name. In <clears throat> Carver is the first uh, governor, but he dies within a year. And so William Bradford becomes the next governor. Anyway, um, the Carvers had John Howland as their indentured servant. So when the Tillys, Mr. and Mrs. Tilly die, 
and Governor and Mrs. Carver die. That's my little alarm clock to tell me I've got five minutes to wrap up this particular part. Uh, I'm just trying to pace myself. Okay, so John and Elizabeth, three years later, they marry during the Pilgrim's fourth winter and they have 10 children, none of whom would exist if John had died in the Atlantic Ocean. And from those 10 children come at least 86 grandchildren. So there's a lot of people whose lives are on the line when John is down in the water and they don't even know it because God hadn't made them yet. That is true of every one of us in this room. There were near misses in the lives of our ancestors. Lots of near misses. Some of them maybe you've learned about. Um, and some you may not learn in this lifetime. But I've had the opportunity to study a lot of my family history as well as some of the family history of my wife and some of the family history of the man who taught me the Bible more than any other man. So he's not, he's not a, a blood relative, but is very important in my life. And I've had an opportunity to learn about some of the near misses that happened in his family history. Well, every one of those near misses is an example of God's providence taking care of somebody so that someone down the road who maybe not even is born yet will have the blessings that God intends to give that person. Well, here's a picture of John Howland's grave marker. And one of the things it says is he married Elizabeth, daughter of John Tilly, who came with him in the Mayflower, December of 1620. From them are descended numerous posterity. That's putting it mildly. Okay. So, um, let's just think about how all of this tragedy is blended in with God pushing forward his Genesis mandate for people to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And they're now filling a part of the earth that nobody else wants to live at. So, what about their children? First child, a daughter, Desire. She's mom of 11. Then comes the first son, John, dad of 10. Then a daughter, Hope, mom of 12. Then another daughter, Elizabeth, named for her mother, of course, uh, mom of nine. Then comes daughter, Lydia, mom of four. I wonder what happened there. Anyway, Hannah, mom of nine. Joseph, dad of nine. Jabez, dad of 11. Ruth, mom of three. And Isaac, dad of eight. None of those kids would have been born if John had died in the Atlantic Ocean. Eventually, John and Elizabeth move in with their son Jabez when they get too old to take care of themselves. And then when um, John Howland dies, his widow, Elizabeth, moves in with their daughter, Lydia. And I think that's supposed to be the oldest building that we have from the Pilgrims is, is the one that you see in the picture on the top. Of course, they've renovated it. Well, few of the descendants of theirs who have lived in the uh, 20th or 21st century or both. Uh, we have Franklin D. Roosevelt. We have um, several Bushes. That is, <clears throat> the younger Bush is descended from John and Elizabeth Howland from both his father and his mother, which means his parents are cousins of the probably distant cousins. <clears throat> and also you see uh, in the black and white photos on the bottom, uh, you see two of the wives of Teddy Roosevelt, if I remember right. They, I think they were cousins, but they were descended from John and Elizabeth Howland. And then you see somebody who's back from the future and you see an Alaskan uh, governor there. But there are many others who are alive today because John and Elizabeth Howland got married as pilgrims way back in the 1600s. Um, and of course we've already talked about the importance of the uh, uh, Mayflower Compact to our political system. Okay, um, we're getting ready to talk about some of the Indian friends. Uh, but I need to ask, when, when do, we, do we take a break at every hour, or uh, when do we take breaks? Uh, like five minute break. Okay, hour. all right. 
So let me uh, let me go for about four minutes, and then we'll take a break. Okay. Obviously, it was not easy to live in Plymouth if you were one of those who came over with the Pilgrims, and <clears throat> they they were uh, very literate people, and they wanted their descendants to appreciate that they had had a very harsh yet adventurous experience and that God had taken care of them and that they were very well aware of the fact that none of the successes that they had in the new world would have been successful if God had not been gracious to them. Our fathers were Englishmen who came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity. That's what uh, William Bradford recalls. Um, Plymouth Rock, uh, a lot of folks don't realize they had a rock band. But, you know, you can't believe everything you find on the Internet. But, uh, notice the uh, drumstick there. Yeah, turkey. Okay. All right. Um, the first winter was harsh. Half of the pilgrims died. Uh, the Indian corn, okay, we'll end on, we'll, I'll cover the Indian corn and then we'll take a break. The English pilgrims had a difficult time finding adequate food. And at one point when they were scouting about, they found Indian corn, which is what they called, what we call corn. And they took it. And some who uh, don't like the pilgrims, basically because they were Christians, will say, oh, they stole corn from the Indians. Well, not so fast. That's not exactly how it happened. Actually, um, under English law, you are allowed to take your neighbor's property under some circumstances. If your neighbor is on vacation and your house is on fire and you have a baby on the second floor and you need a ladder now and you don't have a ladder, but your neighbor has a ladder leaning against your neighbor's house. And so you run over and you grab your neighbor's property, a ladder, without permission, and you run over there and you prop it up against your house and you scamper up there and you bust through the window and you, you rescue the baby. And then you come down and the fire is just consuming the house and next thing you know, you've got the baby in a safe place and now the fire is burning up your neighbor's ladder. Uh, under English law, for many centuries, this has been the case, it still is, uh, that is called the law of private emergency. If you have a private emergency, you are allowed to take your neighbor's property to save a life. But if it gets destroyed in the process, you have to pay for it later. You know, you'll have to pay for it while the, while the fire is going. And so the pilgrims, knowing that, when they were starving, and they came upon this food and they didn't see anybody nearby. They went, okay, we're going to take this. But they realized we have to pay for this later. We need to figure out who owned this food. And after we have survived this emergency, this life and death emergency, we have to eventually pay for this food. And it took them six months to figure out who they should pay. Of course, the main reason for that was the people who'd stored the food, where were they? They were all dead. And so what do you do if you owe money to somebody who's dead? Well, you try to figure out, okay, who are their nearest relatives? And you know, you'd pay your debt to their nearest relatives. So that's what they did. And this was a real important thing for the pilgrims because they were wanting to be honest people. And, <clears throat> and so William Bradford on pages 65 and 66 of his history, and then later on page 88, he talks about how they found the food, the beans and the corn, <coughs> And that they knew that they had to make full payment, make full satisfaction for the fair market value of, of that food. And it took them six months to figure out which Indian tribe was the closest ones to those who put the food there. Anyway, it gives you a, an idea of, of uh, how they cared about doing the right thing. Well, at this point, let's take how many minute break? Five minute break. And so we'll come back at uh, seven, about seven after seven.